I do think you need to ask yourself the question, are you motivated more by wealth or by fame? And just be really, really honest with yourself. Shaquille O'Neal is rich. Guy up in the owner's box who's paying Shaq's salary is wealthy. I always wanted to be the owner up in the box. I never wanted to be the racehorse. I wanted to be the owner. I think the number one secret to business success overall is to fall in love with your customers, fall in love with your market, not your product. You have to understand the process and systems behind selling and you can't avoid talking to human beings. If I could have a hundred plus conversations from months to a single day, and that's exactly what I did. Hello everyone and welcome back to The Introvert's Edge and I'm ecstatic to introduce to you our guest today, Ryan Dice, who is not only the founder and CEO of Digital Marketer, but also the founder of the Traffic and Conversion Summit. So Ryan, welcome to the show, mate. Thanks for coming. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you for um, bringing up this important topic. I think it's good for everybody to, to go out there and, and, and acknowledge uh, you know, our strengths and our weaknesses and what that means for us moving forward. So, Everybody that sees you, that I know, talks about you as that extroverted person that they wish that they had that skill set. I'd love to hear sort of where you came from and how you got to where you were. Sure. I mean, and, and I can speak to some, some things that maybe I haven't talked about as much uh, before that may uh, resonate more with the people that are watching it that are like us, right? So um, I, I started my very first online business in 1999. Uh, I wanted to make some extra money. And um, at the time, you know, you think about 1999, those of who were around then and, and, and adults then. It seems like a lot of the people working for me today were still in diapers in 1999. But um, if you weren't, then you know, I mean, the, the dot-com boom was, was it. And, and lots of people, certainly I, I was going to school at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, Dell was, this was in the middle, like they're, you know, dude, you're getting a Dell campaign. So everybody knew Dell and in around Austin, everybody knew Dell Computer Company and heard my, Michael Dell's story and how he, you know, got all this money. So there was this entrepreneurial fervor and this entrepreneurial energy around that. And, uh, and, and so I wanted, a, I wanted a piece of it. I wanted a part of it. And uh, I originally uh, decided that I was going to um, be a web designer because that I figured, hey, all these people are going to need websites so I can figure out how to do that and I'll market myself as a web designer. I, I wasn't very successful at that because I wasn't very successful at marketing um, myself. And so I actually turned that web design business into an email list. I said, I'm going to, you know, instead of trying to do web design, I'm, I'm going to instead, um, I'm going to instead start this little newsletter, this email newsletter where I'm going to, uh, you know, post a an email every single week for other designers like me, even though I'd never really done it. Um, and so that was kind of my first foray into, into online marketing and, and building a list. And I eventually, you know, offered them different products and services. One of my first successes was actually my only web design client that I ever had. And this person wasn't able to pay me, but uh, this particular lady was a lactation consultant. And um, so did a lot of work with uh, nursing moms. And one of the things that she needed help with was building a website to sell her services. So I helped with that. And then she said, can you help me, um, you know, create a product that I could sell to them after they're no longer nursing their kids. We created this product on how to make your own baby food and um, helped to produce that. And when she couldn't pay me, she gave me that product. And, and literally one of the first products that I ever sold online was um, a product on how to make your own baby food. But if, if I were to think back on it, so much of, of my, the, the choices that I made in terms of, of business, and they benefited us mightily, but it's not like they were that strategic. It's not like I said, okay, the web is going to be this big thing. You need to figure that out. It really came out of not wanting to talk to people. You know, I loved the idea of being able to start this business where I could be in my dorm room or my college, you know, apartment, and I could be selling things to people all over the world and never have to really engage face to face. And it sort of, it was fortunate that I was born in the time that I was born in all of us, right? Where we can do that. We do have the ability to do that. Uh, and gosh, I was in this making hundreds of thousands of dollars in sales while I was in college, uh, having never spoken uh, to any of my customers except via email. And even when I did that, I did it under, you know, a pseudonym. I didn't use my, my real name. So um, it was pretty powerful. I don't know if I had been born, you know, 30 years prior, if I would have been as entrepreneurial, because I think that meant a very different thing than that it means today. But uh, that was where I got my start. And, and, you know, went from selling that one book on how to make your own baby food to selling tons of little eBooks and pieces of software to launching multiple e-commerce and, and media companies. So um, here we are today. So it's been a good ride. Well, thanks for sharing that, Ryan. And I think one of the, the things that always, the thing that astounds me about you is how many companies you now run 
and have a management uh, piece in. And I, I think a lot of people think that as an introvert, you can't be a great leader and you can't run a great company. And you know, I've, I've been to your office in Austin and I've seen the, you have some amazing people that work there and they all love working for your organization. And I know that in all the organizations you're part of, you create a really strong culture. And I, th I think I'd really love for you just to share how you've sort of created that culture and, and how you use your introversion as a, as a strength rather than feeling like it's something that you shouldn't be doing. For me, what I found is that, you know, the act of ongoing management, you know, which is a lot of following up with people uh, was always very difficult for me. Um, so as long as we kept our company very entrepreneurial and as long as the people that were reporting to me um, were people that I could say, okay, here's, here's what we should do. You know, this is the objective. So I can get a very small team in a room and I have, I have no problem saying, you know, writing on a whiteboard and, and planning out, okay, this is where we need to go. But I knew that I needed to surround myself with people who really loved people and they got their energy from other people. And so they would then take that message. They would take those ideas and they would go leverage human beings to get it done. I was never going to be the person that was going to be able to, um, to manage a large team, but I could lead a large team if I had really solid people, people below me. Um, if I had those people that, that were on my team that, that when I talked to them, um, they knew what to do and they weren't afraid to go and work, work with the team to get it done, then it was going to be fine. Cause I never have a problem working with a handful of people. Um, it, it's, it's when, you know, it gets into lots and lots and lots of people that it gets a little more, it gets a little more tricky. And just for me, it's difficult and, and, um, and it's exhausting, you know, to, to follow people and to sit in, in meetings with lots and lots of, of folks. But if I can always have a core team around me who they get me and, uh, and they'll tolerate me. And then when I say, okay, here's what we're going to do, they'll take it and run with it. And they go, so, so right now I have four direct reports um, in a company with over a hundred employees. And so it's, it's not so hard to do it if you do it that way. I think the mistake that a lot of, that a lot of introvert, introverts might make is they'll, they won't identify leadership and management are two different things. And uh, management can be very difficult um, if, you know, if, if you're an introvert, it can be, it can be different. It doesn't mean that introverts can't be made to be great managers. There's lots of things that I do that I don't necessarily enjoy, but we need to get them done, right? So, I mean, it, we never want to be a slave to our, you know, default settings, but, um, but I, I never want to stay in that management role where I know that I'm going to need to be, you know, doing follow-up with lots and lots of people all the time because it's just very difficult. I think that's a really good thing for people to know because I think that a lot of introverts that are growing, they, they say, all right, well, I need to start managing my team. Where you said, what I need to do is go and find my core people that are going to help me manage my team. What, would, what did you look for? I mean, let's say, let's go back to when you were looking for your first core person. What were the qualities that you looked for? And what are the qualities in the people that you look for now to be part of that, that group of four? Yeah, I mean, it needs to be someone who, um, it, is they can't be a micromanager. Um, they need to be someone who does work and, and they enjoy passing their knowledge down to others and they enjoy seeing other people win. So I like looking for people who, when they're managing a small team or when they're in a group, they, they wanna give credit to others on the team. That's definitely one of the things that, that I look for. Uh, an, an enormous level of, of just organizational abilities, right? I mean, these are people who, they don't brag about their inboxes, you know, having hundreds and thousands of, of unread emails. These are people who generally, um, they're great at follow-up. Uh, I know for me, I'm not that great at follow-up and, it, and it's not because I'm just, you know, and, and it's not because I want to be like rude or disorganized or it's not like a, a diva thing. It's that I just don't, I don't like it. I know if I follow up and we get into a conversation, then it's going to, you know, it's going to keep on going. And generally I, I want to hang out and read and, you know, come up with ideas, right? So to find somebody who is really phenomenal at follow up, um, when I see that and when I see them, you know, willing to give credit to other people on their team, uh, and they're obviously competent in the field that we're working in, then I know that that's, that's going to be somebody that's a, a pretty good um, match for me. Somebody who's going to be uh, somebody that I can definitely work with. That's great, Ryan. Thank you for sharing that. I, I, I think a lot of introverts really struggle to find those core people. So I, I think looking for those, those specific qualities would be really, really helpful. Well, and they're also, I should say, they're going to be people that are, that are going to irritate the crap out of you. Um, so they're <laughs> going to be the people who, you know, when you go, if you, like, I know 
that it, I've got these people on my team and, and we go to a, you know, a, a networking type function and they're the ones that are going around talking to everybody trying to, you know, loop me into conversations and I hate it. So I know that's exactly who I need, you know, in that role. So it's forcing you to do things that you don't want to do, but things that are helpful to you. Yeah. And they're willing to do and actually enjoy the things that you don't like to do. So often when we're hiring, we hire people that we like, which means they're a lot like us because we're intensely arrogant and selfish as human beings, right? So if you find yourself really, really liking someone a lot, if you're like, oh my God, they remind me so much of me, that's probably not the person um, that you're going to want because you're going to say like, oh, hey, what do you say? We just, you know, huddle up and work on this together. And, and they're gonna be like, oh my God, it's a freaking great idea. And they're never going to leave that cave and go out there and get the work done with other people. That's brilliant. And it's, it's funny, I've had a lot of introvert, extrovert teams that, you know, have had really successful companies because they understand that about each other. And the extrovert will push them out to do extroverted activities. But the introvert will say, hang on a second, we really need to think about this before we step out. And it creates such a great dynamic. So it's really amazing that you've managed to create that in a, a staff dynamic. And the fact that you're also humble enough to, to take the lead of those people that you've hired to make sure that you end up in the conversations you need to. I'm, I mean, at the end of the day, and I, I mentioned this before, um, I see whether you're an introvert or you're an extrovert, that's your default setting. You're not a slave to it. You know, so people ask me all the time, like, oh, I can't believe that, that you're able to go out there and speak and do all these things. I mean, I want the end result. You know, something has to be, has to be better than that. It, now, as we grow and as we scale, I wanna arrange things so that, you know, I can get through it more easily but in the beginning, look, I'll do whatever I have to do um, to make that thing happen. Uh, and, and I think that everybody needs, and if there's one bit of encouragement that I could give to my introvert friends out there, it's like, acknowledge it, but you don't get to use that as an excuse necessarily. You acknowledge it so that you can say, oh, that's why this is hard. But just because it's hard doesn't mean that you are absolved from having to do it. So yeah, I mean, it irritates the crap out of me when we go to a meeting and one of my more extroverted people like, oh, I want you to meet this person. I'm like, Ugh, but I know they're right. And so um, as long as you keep what are your bigger goals in mind and you recognize that, that it, takes all, it takes all flavors uh, to, get, to get it done, then uh, you, know, you kind of get over yourself pretty quickly. Or you don't get the thing that you want and you just become a bitter, worthless human being. I don't want that as an, as an option. So. Yeah, that's the last thing you want to be remembered for, I think. So, yeah, no, great advice. I want to transition for a second because you talked about writing blogs and, you know, a lot of what you talked about is, you know, I use, I created great content, I created an email list, I sold without ever speaking to people. The world's changed a little bit these days. And, you know, I was, I was talking through, Dell is one of our sponsors for Small Business Festival, and they were talking about how they created all this great written content, and then they realized the world's gone video. And... Yeah. You and I are very private people. Like you have your family and you've got your proper family time and you'll go and you, a lot of your life is, is behind closed doors. And then you go out to events that you're dragged along to and told that you need to meet specific people. And now the world's video and you've got to get in front of a camera more frequently. And I mean, this is a great example. This is a, a video production rather than just an audio or just could I get you to write a blog post and contribute it to the website? How have you found coping with that and what strategies have you used and for people that have to get in front of video now is it something they have to do or is it something they can choose to do what would you suggest somebody in your company is going to need to be out and and they're going to need to be the face of that company and um if i had it to do all over again and uh, you know all things being equal i would have i would have much rather somebody else been the face of digital marketer and i was just the person behind the scenes but that's not how it worked out um you know i was the one that that needed to be out there in the beginning because I was the only one that was there. So it made sense that I would be the, the person that was there. And then once it's done, there's no going back, you know? So I, I just accept what it is like, do I enjoy it? You know, no, I don't, I don't necessarily enjoy being on all the videos and things like that, that, that digital marketer puts out. And that's why I've, I've sought to really build more of a company brand as opposed to a personal brand. You know, so we're digital marketer. We're not ryandice.com. I don't even know what's at ryandice.com. Um, and I've very, I've been very, very, um, you know, particular and, and very deliberate about building digital marketer as a brand and about highlighting other people on the team who are more extroverted and who like being on camera. And so I can say, Hey, you want to learn about Facebook ads? Talk to Molly. You want to learn about, you know, conversion rate optimization and, and testing, you know, here's Justin, you know, and here's sales, you know, talk to, you know, talk to Marcus. Uh, I'll even drag, you know, Richard Lindner up 
from time to time to talk about email stuff, but he's an introvert like me. So that doesn't, that doesn't get very far. Right. So, um, so a lot of it is building a team. I'll tell you, if you're going to be both an introvert and you're going to be a micromanager and you're going to be kind of so arrogant that everything has to be about you. I don't see how you get through life without being miserable um, because everything inside of you is not going to want to do the things that you feel like you have to do for whatever reason. Um, but I have no problem highlighting other people on the team and having them be on camera. I also, while I may not enjoy it, have no problem being on camera if that means that that's what it takes to grow the company and to be successful. Also, I don't so much mind you know, being on, being on camera it, to me, isn't that, isn't that big a deal? Cause it's still, you know, it's just us talking right now. I can kind of psych myself out of it. Um, even being on a stage in front of a lot of people, if I have a rear, you know, backstage entrance and exit, uh, even that's okay because there's a clear kind of wall, like a separation type thing. Um, speaking in front of a room of 20, 30 people, that's way harder for me than speaking in a room of two, three, four, five thousand you know, funny enough. So I think part of the reason that I've, you know, even the event is structured the way that it is, um, is because I, I try to build things to where they're going to be most comfortable. But my desire is to end up there. Uh, I'm never going to say, well, because I don't like this, I'm not going to do it. Uh, I'm going to do what needs to get done, uh, whether it's shooting a video, whether it's, you know, leading a meeting, you know, with, uh, you know, at the company, I'm going to do what needs to get done. But as soon as it works, one of the perks of success is then you get to make your own rules. So then I'm going to change things a little bit and try to make it to where it is easier for me. A lot of my just aversion from doing certain things that I don't want to do comes off as uh, humble. So maybe we'll have a chance to get into that. I'm probably not as <laughs> humble as, as people want to make it seem. So. Well, well, then let's do that then. So why do you think that you have that effect? Or why do you think you coming across as humble is actually a result of something else? something we talked about in part one, right? I mean, much of, of the way that I've structured digital marketer was, you know, I want to put other people out front so that I don't need to be the one that's, that's out front. You no, know, yes. I love the fact that, uh, that the people who uh, are really brilliant around me, that they get their, that they get the credit that they deserve. But I also frankly don't want to be the person. I mean, I remember when traffic and conversion summit was, you know, me and my business partner, Perry, literally every single session. And by the end of like a three day event where I'm up on stage all day, for three days, I just am curling up in a ball because I'm exhausted. You know, take in every break, I'm out, you know, chatting with people. And it, it was just, it was brutal. He loved it because he's, he's an extrovert. He's going out like drinking and partying with people at night. I'm like, I'm going to bed. It's eight o'clock and I'm already asleep. Um, so I, I just didn't, I didn't want it to keep being that. So I was always happy to put other people um, up there. And even on the teams, like I, I don't necessarily want to manage lots and lots of people. So I want to surround myself with you know, good, strong quality managers so that I'm talking to a handful of people, you know, I mean, that, that, that may come off looking like, oh, he's very humble. He doesn't want to be the person out there, you know, leading the charge and taking credit. It's like, no, I just don't want to be the person out there. I don't mind the credit so much, but yeah. Well, that's actually got two positives, right? So you come across as, as very humble. So that has a great effect on your customers and all the people you have contact with and your staff love you for it. So you need to set the record straight. I'm, I'm an insane delusional narcissist. So <laughs> Let's actually talk about that though, because that's a crossroads for a lot of people. A lot of people want to take the credit, but as introverts, we don't want to be the center of attention. So that was a logical choice for you. How do you suggest other people make that decision? Because a lot of people, you know, everyone sees you as Ryan Dice of Digital Marketer, who you are now and go, well, he doesn't need all of the credit. He's fair enough to give it away to other people, but maybe they still need that internal validation. How did you handle that trade-off starting from, from your humble beginnings? I do think you need to ask yourself the question, um, are you motivated more by, uh, by wealth or by fame? Uh, and, and just be really, really honest with yourself. Because I mean, the three reasons that kind of people do anything is, you know, I want to make money and in business, right? I, I want to make money. Uh, I want to be famous. And then they'll throw out and I want to make a difference. And, and I think the, the I want to make a difference thing is, is great. Everybody says that. But I mean, it's not mutually exclusive to the other two. And, and when people say, I'm just doing this because I want to make a, dif a difference, like, fine, would you do it for free? And some people will go so far as like, absolutely, I would do this for free. Okay, can you do it for free? Because if the answer is no, if you still need money to like eat food and stuff like that, then that can't be your primary driver. You cannot with all sincerity say that the main reason I'm doing this is because I just want to make a difference. 
because I'm sorry, at some point, basic, like Maslow's hierarchy of needs is going to catch up with you. Okay. And so you just have to decide and be really, really honest with yourself. Uh, Because I know people, I know people who are way more motivated by fame than they are money. Truly. I mean, they need to make, they want to make enough money, but you give them the opportunity to pursue a particular path that's going to increase their fame or their status and they're going to jump on it. For me, that was just never the case with me. And, and I think it, it is, I don't think that necessarily makes me a better person because that, that means I'm in it for the money. I don't know if, if being in it for the money is any better than being in it for the fame, but, um, you know, but that's the reason that, that I'm working as hard as I am. And yeah, I enjoy it. I mean, I, re, I recognize that it's not that simple, but that motivator I see in most people, you know, money, fame, what's it going to be? Uh, so kind of the logical thought experiment that I went through is, okay, well, if I'm in it, if I'm in it more for the money, uh, and it's not so much for the fame, then what do I want to be? And I remember um, there was this Chris Rock bit, you know, the comedian Chris Rock? Yeah. You know, and he's like talking about the difference between being rich and being wealthy. And, um, and he talked about how, and this was back in, you know, the early 2000s uh, when Shaquille O'Neal was in the league. And, you know, he's like, Shaquille O'Neal is rich. They're like, now the, you know, of course, Chris Rock, you know, the white guy up in the owner's box is who's paying Shaq's salary is wealthy. And so for me, I always more wanted to be the owner up in the box, watching things happen. Um, you know, I, I never wanted to be the racehorse. I wanted to be the owner, you know? And, and so I think a lot of times, especially as entrepreneurs in the beginning, we, um, we identify with the racehorse. We identify with the athlete because that's who you have to be. You're the only one right? That you're all that there is. So you can't start from the beginning and be like, oh, I just want to, you know, be the person in the owner's box and just let everything happen. No, 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 no. You don't get to do that. In the beginning, you're the one that's out there. You're the one that's hustling. You're the one that's, that's doing what you have to do. But just because that's what it is in the beginning doesn't mean that that's how it has to be forever. And so I was very, very intentional of saying, I'm going to do this in the beginning because I have to. But as soon as I don't have to, I'm going to figure out what are the things that I really don't like doing. And, and typically, the things that we don't like doing are also the things that we're bad at. Not always. Not always. I don't particularly enjoy public speaking, but it's something that I'm, that I'm pretty good at. So I do it. It benefits the company. It's high enough leverage, so I do it. Um, but there are a lot of things that I didn't enjoy and I was bad at. So I just started right from those saying, I'm going to get somebody else to do this. Uh, and that was really how the, how the company grew. But it, it started with just having a knowledge of, you know, I'm not in this for the fame. If I'm not in this for the fame, then I want to be an owner, not, a, not an athlete, right? I, I want to be a producer, not the star, right? I mean, there's so many, if you look at every category of entertainment, right? There's always the owner, the producer, the director, and then there's the star. Most of us resonate more with the star, at least in the beginning, but I wanted to own the production company, right? I wanted to, to have the names, name in the credits, the person that took home the big paycheck, but I didn't want to be the person who was, who was on screen. So I was very deliberate about thinking, what are the things that I don't enjoy? How can I get somebody else to help me with this? I think that's really valuable, Ryan. And I, I think the other thing is that you talked about the fact that you made the decision that you wanted to make money. And I mean, you're, it's a business. We have to be okay with saying that we want to make money. I mean, the goal is we look, we've got to look at where we get our internal motivation from. And if our internal motivation is about being the celebrity and going towards fame, well, fair enough. And we need to earn enough money to survive while we're building our fame. But if our goal is that we want to create a happy life for our family and we want to give money to Greenpeace and whatever you want to do with the money, but if you want to be able to make that decision and the business's goal is to make money, that, that's okay too. It's necessary if it's a business, right? I mean, I think, that's, I think that's critical. You know, your business could also decide to do some other things. And, and uh, you know, as you said, what you choose to do with it once it's made is, is obviously up to you. If you want to, you know, make a bunch and give it all away, that's, that's completely fine. But if you're going to operate, if you're making the decision, you know, which is, uh, that's who we're talking to, right? I mean, we're talking to entrepreneurs and business owners right now. Yeah. So if you're, if you're making that decision that that's what you want to do and money is not a factor in it, then you're doing the wrong thing. I mean, truly, you'd be much, much happier. And there's nothing wrong with it of saying, I want to align myself with somebody else's dream, with somebody else's vision, come alongside them and help support that. But to say, I want to start a business, but I'm not in it for the money, I think is just, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's at best a bad model. 
Well, you're running a charity almost really, aren't you? So- you're running a charity without the tax benefits. I mean, there's, there's so many things that, that, that don't make sense about that. So, I mean, yeah, if, if you're, if you're going to run a business, then you have to be about, about the money because the people that work for you, they're working for you for money, you know, at, at, at some basic level, right? They need to eat. They're not working for you for free. So, I mean, it, it, you can't completely divorce those two things. And that's why I think at the beginning, you have to say, I want more. I want to build something that somebody else hasn't built or that they're not doing right now. So that means I'm going to have to work harder. It means I'm going to have to do things that I'm not necessarily comfortable with. But with that should also come some additional rewards because make no mistake, if you start a business, you're taking additional risk and you're working harder than someone who doesn't do that. So you deserve to have certain rewards. And for me, a base level reward is I just don't want to do the things that I don't like to do forever. I'm willing to do them for the short term. I'm absolutely willing to do it, but I don't want to have to do it forever. I have to know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. And so if you can bake that in, then, then you're going to be in good shape. Look, I'm 100% with you and I, I make the same decision all the time. So I will create videos because that leverages me. It means I don't have to have a thousand conversations. I can just have a thousand views. So it's about making that logical choice to unemploy yourself because if you own the business and you're unemployed, you're still making money. And that, that's a really positive thing. Now, let's talk about the things that you may not be comfortable doing, Ryan. Like you, you said at the start that you had to do things that weren't comfortable and some of them you perhaps weren't even good at. And let's talk about how, did you do anything to try and better yourself? Did you gravitate to trying to be more behaving, more extroverted? Did you find techniques that worked for you? How did you come across, we talk about public speaking and, and networking. What was some of the strategies as an introvert that weren't naturally good at these things, what did you do to become better at it? So, I mean, speaking about those two particular categories, networking, um, I would always go into any, any one of the, the networking scenarios saying, I'm, I'm, I would pick a number. I'm going to meet two people that I haven't met yet. And I'm going to ask them, you know, a, a couple of questions. And I would just be very, very deliberate. Um, I would make sure that I asked a minimum of five questions um, about them before I ever started talking about myself. Um, that's how I got out of having kind of very trite surfacey conversations. Cause I also just abhor any kind of, you know, I don't, I don't like, like to me, I'm very uncomfortable. I'll meet these people that they want to go really deep and really intimate really quickly. That freaks me out. Um, I don't like that. So I never wanted to, to be that, but I also just abhor the, how about the weather? I'm like, right, let's not do this. We're faking it. Um, so I would force myself at the beginning to say, I'm going to meet at least two new people that I haven't met before. I'm going to start up conversations. That's going to be hard, but it only has to be two. And when I'm done with two, I can leave. So I'd give my permission, myself permission to leave after two. Now, if something really got going, then, then great. I would stay. And that's usually what happened, right? Cause momentum is a powerful thing, but I would say, I'm going to start two conversations and a conversation means I ask them at least five follow-up questions about themselves or, or whatever the topic was. So I had to, that meant that, um, that when I engaged in the conversation, I had to be listening closely because sometimes I'll get in my own head and I'll ask a question. Like, I don't know about you, I'll ask people their name and then immediately forget what their name was. I, was, I won't even listen to the answer, right? It just kind of washes yeah. over me. Every time. So I go up to him, you know, hey, my name's Ryan, how's it going? What, what brought you here? That was usually my opening question. So now I had to listen to their answer and figure out, okay, what's a follow-up question? And in my head, I'm sitting there counting. I might even have my hand in my pocket and I'm like, you know, kind of one, two, three, you know, <laughs> trying to keep track. And what was amazing is, you know, by the time I get to five, it was just a real life human conversation and it would work out just fine. And then I'm in it. And, um, you know, I, I never have an issue talking and hanging out with a friend. My problem is I don't want to talk out, talk to groups of people or go and meet a bunch of strangers. So that was kind of the trick that I did uh, in networking situations, two people, five questions. Um, and then in speaking engagements, uh, again, I, I never had a, a hard time really speaking from stage. Um, I didn't, I think that being an introvert and, and, you know, being nervous about speaking are really kind of two different things. Um, I have a hard time it, for me. It's like I said, it's harder speaking to a very, very small group, but speak, doing a stage presentation, that's just a presentation. There's a sea of humanity out there and they're too far away to like stab you and sell you drugs, which is what all strangers want to do. I learned that in, in school. Right. So, um, so, uh, so for me, I, I wanted to, number one, I, I really prefer to speak at events that have a backstage entrance. 
because if I'm waiting in the back of the room and people are talking to me, it's really, really hard. And if when I leave and I'm done talking, I need to go down and everybody's waiting around and asking questions. Again, really, really difficult. I'll do it. I'll do it, but I prefer the comfort and safety of a stage. So now usually when I speak, I prefer to speak at larger events. Larger events tend to have stages at the back entrance. And if I'm going to do q and I prefer to do Q&A publicly. But the biggest thing about speaking, uh, the biggest trick that I had was really just a mindset shift, which is um, they're not here for me. They don't care about me. They really don't. I could do a bad job. I could do a great job. They're going to utterly forget about me tomorrow. And if I'm boring, they'll forget about me in a matter of seconds, right? But really, really good, really, really bad. I'm still vapor in their life in, you know, a matter of hours. So what should matter? Well, the only thing that should matter is what am I going to leave them with that's going to make them think, wow, I'm really glad that I, I gave that a little bit of my time. So I, I shifted all my focus away from, you know, me and what do they think about me? And I don't want to look stupid into them. What do they want? I got an audience full of people. They've all arrived here. So I'm, I'm again, very deliberate. If I'm speaking at an event, I want to know what's the makeup of the audience. What's the topic of the event? I've had people show up to speak at Traffic and Conversion Summit and not even realize that it was a digital marketing event. You know, it's like, that's what people want. Like, talk about that. I've had, you know, we've had speakers break into their normal boring keynote. And I specifically said, hey, talk about how you leverage digital marketing in that. And they didn't. And, and I remember how much that irritated me because when you speak, you speak not for yourself, not for your brand, not for whatever thing you may even want to sell then or down the road. You speak to deliver value to the people that are there. And so if you spend way more of your time focusing on who are they, why do they come, what can, how can I connect some of what I know to them, then you're not thinking about yourself. You're spending so much time thinking about them that you don't have time to think about yourself. You don't have time to worry about yourself. So now when I speak, it's basically just, I, I don't think about me. I don't worry what I'm saying, what I'm doing. And if I look stupid or I say the wrong thing, I don't really worry about it or care. And I found that nobody else does either. And what, it, what comes out is like, wow, this person genuinely seems to want to deliver value. There's times when I do a better job than others, but I know my intent. And as long as I know my intent, I don't get nervous because I can't fail. You know, I, I, I can't fail completely. I can do a better or worse job, but I can't fail if I really genuinely and sincerely try to deliver value. Um, and if that, my focus is there, then it's not on, you know, do I look dumb? Did I stumble over that word? Did I forget a part? Is my zipper down? You know, all those things kind of go away. That's the one that gets me every time I go on stage. Just before I'm like, oh, better check the zipper. So I do, I do have a little, I do have a little check that, I, that I'll do. take every time. <laughs> So I've, I've had the occasional time where I've gone on stage and I'm like, oh, I haven't done the check. Do I do the awkward check when you're on stage or do you just go through the entire stage presentation? Just validate it. Yeah. <laughs> I realize I forgot to check and then you come in for the, and you yeah. awkwardly touch yourself on stage in front of thousands of people. Yeah. Not always, not always a good look and always the time where everyone catches it on video. So no, I would not suggest that to anyone at home. Right. Let's, let's transition for a second into selling. Because you earned your living out of sending emails to people and using online as a forum for sales. A lot of people love this new world of digital marketing because it means that they can be at home on their laptop and not really have any contact with people. Do you feel that in today's world, we can avoid the world of sales altogether? Or do you feel that it's still important that we understand the, the processes and the systems behind selling? you have to understand the process and systems behind selling and you can't avoid talking to human beings. I think if anything, it's moving back more that direction um, as a company. I mean, I know a digital marketer, one of the metrics that we track is uh, value per conversation and cost per conversation. So how much does it cost to generate a conversation? So it's CPC, but it's not cost per click. We track that as well, but I want to know. How many conversations, a real live conversation via Facebook Messenger, a real live conversation via text, and yeah, real live conversations via the phone, and then what's that worth to us? Now, again, I don't want to be the one having those conversations, so that's why we, you know, built a sales team. Uh, we built, have, the, have a monetization team. We're salespeople who either enjoy having those kind of conversations or who just are willing to do it. Our number one top salesperson is an introvert, right? He is, he is an introvert, but he still enjoys the process of selling and he's 
trained himself to do the things that, I mean, the, the people I know who are in great shape don't just love working out all the time, right? They, they do it because it's good for them and they're, they're good enough at it that they, they derive, you know, some meaning from it. But I, I remember at Traffic and Conversion Summit uh, two and a half years ago when we were first coming out with Digital Marketer HQ, which is our, our, product, um, our, our, our product offering where we, we put all of our uh, certifications in, in one place. Um, so if you're a team, you know, you're a manager, you can go in, you can get this for your team, get them fully trained on all, all the different aspects of digital marketing. They figure it out so you don't have to train them, right? That's the, that, that's the basic offering. Well, this product didn't yet exist, but it was an idea. It was something that I knew we wanted to build. So I announced at Traffic Conversion Summit from the stage that this is something that we're going to come out with. It's going to be called Digital Market HQ. All of our training certifications are going to be in one place. It's designed for managers to train their teams. Um, it doesn't exist yet, but if you have questions or if you're interested in signing up for a beta, come back to the Digital Marketer booth and I'll personally be back there answering questions. So I sat back at the Digital Marketer booth for an entire day and had literally hundreds of conversations. It was miserable. Like you could not think, like if you, if, if you were to, to, to come up with a worse scenario for me, it would be, I can't imagine what it would be like. It would like involve like snakes and clowns on my face. I mean, it would be terrible. This was about as close as one of the worst things that I could ever imagine. And yet I knew that if I did not talk face to face, toes to toes, nose to nose with our customers, I was going to be guessing at what they actually wanted. But in that moment, if I could have literally a hundred plus conversations and I could shortcut all the messaging that needed, to be, that needed to be built into the marketing down from months to a single day. So I was willing to do that. And that's exactly what I did. And in that one day I figured out, okay, this is our ideal sales conversation. Okay. This is the avatar of the people that want it. I know that because I had a hundred plus conversations. And I think that more business owners, I don't care if you're an introvert, extrovert, I really don't freaking care. If you don't talk to at least 30, if you don't have at least 30 conversations with, um, with prospects and, and customers about your product, um, then I guarantee you're going to be a terrible marketer. Or, or if you're good, you got lucky. All right. You got lucky and you're not going to be as good the next go round. So yeah, you cannot divorce um, human interaction. H, you know, we call it human to human. It's not B2B. It's not B2C. It's not online. It's humans talking to other humans. But once you've made that investment, now we can take it into the digital realm. And it's amazing when people hear it, they go, oh my God, it's like you're talking just me. It's like you, you can read my mind. Well, I was able to do that because I talked to a hundred of you guys, right? And at the end of the day, humans are remarkably similar. And you talk to the same type of people, they have the same types of problems. So it's not magic, but I was willing to put in the work. And then we built a team who actually liked talking to folks and I could relay what those conversations were. So yeah, you can't, <laughs> I love digital marketing as much as the next guy, but if the phone rings and it's a customer, I'm happy to talk to him. And I think that's part of the reason we've been successful. Thank you for sharing that because I can't tell you how many times I work with new entrepreneurs. I mean, I've you know volunteered to judge Google Startup Weekends and Angel Hacks, and I've spoken to so many people that have been in business for 10 years and they can't get success. And I ask them how many customers they've spoken to. And the answer is none. They go out and they spend two or three years building their online website, worrying about their automation, and they've never gone out and validated it with a single person. And I agree, I don't want to have conversations with people all the time, but your one conversation with 100 people over and over again, yeah, I get it, it would have been horrific. And I've done the exact same thing. I spoke to 50 people before I wrote the sales copy for my Rapid Growth Academy because I wanted to understand who my client was and exactly how to say things in order. And I, I cut 10 years worth of A-B testing and analytics out of the process by just doing that. And for people that are starting new products, you could go and speak to 20 people and find out that 20 people are just not interested in it. And you save yourself a lot of heartache. So I, I, I'm so glad that you said that because you are like the digital marketing go-to person. And so people would naturally assume that you would say, no, just focus on online and you never have to. So I'm, I'm glad that you, you shared because it can save people a lot of heartache and a lot of time. I would never just rely on online data and research and analytics and, you know, all those things. I, I would never launch a new product without talking to at least 30 people. I mean, it's just, it's a rule that I have. It's, it's what I've always done. Um, I never liked it. I still don't like it, but we still do it because it works. And, um, and I think if, if you're unwilling to do that, then there's going to be a lot of other things in business that are a lot harder than that that you're going to be unwilling to do. Uh, better to figure it out now and just 
again, go work for somebody else. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, nothing at all wrong with that, with, with just saying, this isn't for me. Or maybe there's, you just don't want it badly enough yet. So cool, go work for somebody else, go get paid, um, learn in the process, figure some great stuff out and then give it another go. But yeah, I mean, I, it, I can't imagine, I think, and I think a lot of people, even people who aren't introverts, they don't want to have those conversations because they don't want to be told that people aren't really interested in their, in their products. So similar to what I said about if you're doing a stage talk, you know, get really serious and be very, very thoughtful about what do they want? Not so thoughtful about, you know, how, how do you look and what are you going to get from it? That's to me, the number one secret to reducing anxiety on stage. I think the number one secret to business success overall is to fall in love with your customers, fall in love with your, you know, with, with your market not your product. And if you do that, then, then you'll seek to serve them. Um, if you do that, if, they, if it turns out that they don't like your product, you won't take it personally and be like, no, you're stupid, right? You'll, you'll realize that either you got your messaging wrong or maybe you know, you've got the wrong angle. Um, don't fall in love with your product. Fall in love with your customers. Uh, be willing to talk to them even when it's hard. Um, and God dang, just, yeah, be willing to do the, the hard work. <laughs> just because you don't like to do it doesn't mean that you're absolved from it. It just means that if you work hard enough, um, and you have enough success, you eventually get to opt out of it. I don't like mowing my grass and I don't do that anymore either. But you know what? Before I could afford to pay somebody else, I mow my own freaking lawn. So I think the same thing applies to business. That's awesome value, Ryan. And I, yeah, you're right. I mean, when you're going into business, it's going to be painful at the start, but the pain has to be worth the gain. And if you're not willing to have a few painful weeks, a few painful months, or maybe even a few painful years as you scale your business, it's not for you. And there's nothing wrong with being an employee and helping somebody else and clocking off at five o'clock and saying, I'm now gonna go spend some great time with my family. I'm, this weekend, I'm not gonna work. I'm gonna go out to the lake with my friends. There's nothing wrong with that. I know these days we're sitting in this world where entrepreneurism is kind of that new core word, but that you know, you've got to work out whether the trade-off is worth it for you. For me, for Ryan, it, it clearly is because for us, we, we're willing to do or we're willing to do the hard yards and do what people wouldn't so we can live the life that perhaps people can't uh, in the future. However, for you, you've got to make that decision and that decision applies to even the things that you find uncomfortable and even the things that perhaps you may not be good at but you want to have a successful business and you know you need to do. Ryan, there was one last question that I, I wanted to ask you uh, before I ask you the big question, which is, what's your introvert's edge? Uh, but I want to ask you, a lot of people still try to get to you and people say, oh, you know, I want, my, I, I, I want contact with Ryan and you've put all these other people in place. How do you decipher which people you speak to, which people you don't and what things you action? For me, that's really, really simple. A lot of people think that that, that could come off as very standoffish, but um, uh, I have a wife and four children and um, they get first dibs. And then I've got, uh, I have the team that's around me that I want to develop them. And that just doesn't leave a lot of time in the day for other people. So, I mean, I have very specific, I mean, people, my email address is gettable, but I feel no obligation to respond to emails that come to me. And, and that may come off as sounding you know, rude, but I feel no obligation to answer my phone when it rings from somebody that I don't yet know. So um, I do put in certain, certain toll booths. So, I mean, if somebody comes as a referral from somebody that I trust, then yeah, they, they could potentially cut in line. Um, if somebody invests really, really heavily in something that we're doing, I mean, we have mastermind groups and things like that, that's a way to cut in line. So I think it's, I think it's important to remember you're not being rude when you kind of shut, and you're not shutting out the outside world. Um, I just call it prioritizing. And I have 24 hours in every day, just like everyone else does, 365 uh, days in a year. And I start out at the end of every year, sitting down with my wife saying, okay, what days do we want to take family vacations? We don't have to know where we're going, but let's block that off, right? We block off when we're doing certain events. We block off um, when we're doing executive retreats. You know, I block off when I know I'm going to need to work on things. It doesn't leave many just free days left. So for somebody to get access to even an hour within some of these days, it's tough. And, and yeah, I do, people do need to jump through hoops. I, I used to feel bad about it. I don't anymore uh, simply because I like my wife and children and my friends and the people that work here better than somebody who's a stranger because I don't know them yet. It doesn't mean that I'm not willing to, to meet them, but yeah, it is going to be a little bit harder. So 
you know, the, the main thing, I think you need to absolve yourself of that if you're, if you're out there. But do take time. Do leave time out to help people uh, where it is inconvenient and where you don't have a specific objective. If, uh, and so I will make sure that I leave time and I, I will make sure that, you know, every now and then if there's somebody that, that I meet or run across and I can help them, um, that I, I, do make, I, I do make the time to do it. I'm not always able to do it and, and it is fairly random. But uh, that's how you do stay human and that's how you do stay, uh, you know, close to and, and attach those different things. But don't allow yourself uh, to, to fall victim from the, oh, I have to respond to everything or I have to, I have to speak anytime I'm asked. I have to do this. You can't and you won't and you will fail. And I'll tell you, the people that you will let suffer uh, will be those closest to you, those who love you the most because they will give you the most room to hurt them. Um, and ultimately the person you'll hurt the most is yourself because you'll give up on your health and all kinds of other things. So you have to be protective of that and and you have to carve that out. So yeah, I have people that, that around me, everything gets uh, filtered through them. I need to make sure that if, if I'm going to do something, it's referral from somebody that I know either in the company or without, I mean, the way that you got to me is by first getting to know people at digital marketer. So it, it, it's no great big C and there's lots of people I know who we do business with who, again, they sponsored our events for years and, and, you know, helped us out in other ways. They went first and I sought to give back to them. There's no big secrets there, but it does require uh, either time or money or both. Um, and that's how everything is. Well, I, I think that the, the major takeaway I'll take from that is that not to feel bad about saying that one doesn't take priority over going on holidays with my family like I promised I would, or to say that I'd be back by, home by five o'clock. You set yourself some rules and you stick by them. Ryan, I th- look, you've given some amazing value to the, the listeners today. I, ju- I want to ask, you've, you've, you've clearly demonstrated a huge amount of competency and success in everything that you've done. What, what would you attribute, though, as, as your, what we call the introvert's edge, your main ability that you think, if you could pick one, what's been the major driver towards your success? I mean, for me, if I were going to use one, one word, I think, and this is going to sound a little bit silly, so allow me to uh, elaborate, but it's apathy. Um, I really, when I find myself freaked out about something, I have to, then I have to ask myself, does this merit the anxiety that I'm giving it. And very quickly, what I've learned is that um, if it's not about my wife or my children, then it simply does not deserve uh, any real, any much of my emotion whatsoever. I decide what is going to um, make me happy, you know, tremendously happy or tremendously sad. And if it isn't some of those things, then I don't let it do it. And so while I may be an introvert by nature, um, I'm always willing to put in the work because I just don't care about looking foolish. I just don't care about the fact that it's hard. Cry me a river. If I want it, I want it. Um, I don't, I'm not a slave to my initial default setting. I think that's hugely valuable. I mean, I, I think back to the first girl I wanted to date and how incredibly important it was to me right then. And I don't even remember her name now. Those things, as you said, they're just missed. That's the, the things that don't really matter. So I think you're right. Really look at the things that are causing you stress and pain and work out whether the pain's worth the gain. And if it is, just do it because that fear will go. But you'll never forgive yourself for either not doing it or you'll never forgive yourself for doing it. The amount of times my father has got me out of things by I'm really stressed about something and I explain to him, he's like, well, why are you doing it then? And my answer has always been I charge in. But every now and then him saying, why are you, why are you doing that? It doesn't actually matter. You're right. I don't need to do it. And I can step away and, you know, it could be the, the speaking event that I was worried about flying between here and here to do. And I just didn't need to do that to myself. So I think half of the, you know, get, being successful is being willing to say no and being willing to, to evaluate, not just charge into everything, but not also to back away from everything. So Ryan, look, I, I really appreciate you sharing so much detail with the, the listeners today. And I know this is a very different topic for, for you to talk about. And I really appreciate you giving it the time to really help so many people that are you know, struggling with their introversion and, and sharing so honestly you know, your, how you dealt with things and, and how you've managed to make yourself a success, not despite your introversion, but because of it in a lot of ways. Yeah, I appreciate you writing the book and, uh, and getting the word out about this. And hopefully, uh, if nothing else, it will cause people to um, stop using what can be a very good thing, what can be their edge uh, as an excuse to hold them back. So if we accomplish that, then I think it's time well spent.
Thank you. Well, Ryan, just for the people that are listening that don't know who you are, if there's still people like that that exist, how do people find out more about the, the things that you do and, and where would you suggest people get started with the stuff that you do? Sure. Digitalmarketer.com. Um, go check it out. That, that's our homepage. We've got a, a blog there with lots of great free information and, and content down. If you go to digitalmarketer.com and scroll down, we've got some of our top posts. Click on any one of those and you're going to, uh, I think, be happy that you did it. Fantastic, Ryan. Well, look, thank you again for your time, but thanks for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Cheers.